Hey, everybody, welcome again to another episode of the Mosaic Podcast. I feel like a broken record sometimes because some of the things that happen in this podcast to me are so beautiful, so special. And that becomes as a result of people that I get to meet just like you're getting to meet them. My guest today is someone that I, I do not know. Um, but in the short time that I've interacted with her, and it's really been very, very brief, she's someone I want to get to know more. Her name is Liz Lewinson, and she's an author, a speaker, a technologist, a meditation teacher, and a feminist. She's the author of a book called Women, Meditation, and Power, and another book called The Power of the Loving Man. An American Buddhist rebel is another book that she wrote. The Story of Rama, Dr. Frederick Lentz, winner of four literary awards. She's the vice president of the Frederick P. Lentz Foundation for American Buddhism. She began her career as a freelance journalist and segued into Hollywood public relations, landing A-list clients in a number of entertainment se sectors. Intrigued by the field of computer science, she left public relations in the 90s and took in-depth training in computer silence. Silence? Actually, that's my little play on words. Science. Um, she was soon managing complex multi-million dollar IT projects for top Wall Street firms. She recently worked as a communications manager and an ab and ombudsman office in New Zealand. She thought she would live life in New Zealand for the rest of her life, but the USA called her back. You're going to want to know more about this woman, and you can do that by going to www.lizlewinson.com. Don't worry about catching the spelling right now. It's in the show notes. You don't have to worry about that. You're going to want to connect with her on Instagram, and that is going to be her Instagram post is, uh, handle is going to be there and her Facebook to post handle will also be in the show notes below. So without further ado, because this is getting a lot of boring of me talking so much, I want to say, Liz, welcome to the Mosaic podcast and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks for inviting me on. It's my absolute honor. Liz, what did your parents do? My parents were, um, I was born in Canada and my mother initially was a housewife. When they came to the States, when I was seven years old, my father got into insurance and my mother had an art gallery. She was one of the first people to have an art gallery in this area of Los Angeles. Uh, that became Gallery Row. Wow. So that's huge. So she played, she went from what most people would think housewife to uh, like an originator of, of art galleries and Gallery Row in Los Angeles. That's right. How, how, do, were you old enough to know how that happened? How, how she made that pivot? I think that when you're in the difference between living in a more conservative community like Montreal and then coming to LA where there's all this sense of opportunity and we were living, they, my uncle found an apartment in Beverly Hills, that's where we were. So you're surrounded by this sense of people kind of creating their own visions and she loved art. So I think she over time just felt she had the confidence or at least the willingness to try and she did really love art uh, that was sort of original art that might someday become museum quality art so she liked the idea of sponsoring artists fabulous i i can't tell you anymore except that she somehow did it uh, i remember my brothers going every month to help uh, hang art on the walls <laughs> yeah. wow wow and and your father was an insurance salesman. Basically, ultimately he had a small company, but he definitely just started out with insurance. And so as you were growing up, which of the two of them had most impact on you? Which of the two of them did you most want to please and be like, and which one of them? I, I believe there's a mixture because I have a strong art writing streak. I give a lot of credit to Beverly Hills High School for a terrific education. I was glad I was there. But uh, my father was more spiritual. And I think that uh, I learned a lot from him as well. So it, wow. was, a, it was a balance. They, they were not happily married, but uh, nonetheless, 
I didn't know too many people that had parents that were at that time. <laughs> so. Wow. And, and did they end up staying together or did they end up separating? They got divorced when I was 16. When they were 16, wow. You know something, Daniel, back, this was already, this, we're talking back late 50s, early 60s. Wow. People were not divorcing as much. Yes. There was a certain social pressure to stay together. Yes, That's indeed. Why, I mean, I believe were they to get together today, A, they would not have married. They would have had a love affair for a few months and broke it up. That's what I think. And then they also would have not stayed together that long. Yes. That's a good thing, by the way. I, I count this as absolutely healthy. People need to have more freedom. Yeah. So speak of that a little, because I'm sure some people, like, I, I grew up in those times also. Mine, I, I was a few years and perhaps later. Um, but those were times when people didn't have the liberties and the freedoms that we have. And for your parents to be able to know at that point of time that we're better off not together. And for, for you to even see that now as a positive thing, when so many families get split up, especially in those days when it's not common, for them to create the the space for you to say well hold it that was a good thing that wasn't a bad thing they were they did the right thing what would you say to people that see the world not that way that see because this show is all about taking a moment to see different perspectives and what would you say to people where things split up and and they they just are hurt by it and devastated by it and feel and feel left out. How would you help them to see that sometimes these are really good things? Oftentimes they're really good yeah. things. Well, one thing I would say, this is from the perspective of the child. A child really blossoms when the parents are happy. And if they are together and not happy, and there's all that tension or anger, whatever between them, this is yeah. not healthy for a child. It is much, much better to split up and create situations where each individual, the two parents now not functioning together, can be themselves and can also demonstrate positivity, which maybe they never even saw before. So I think there is a value to it now. In the case, there's another thing in general, which a situation you just described, which is you made a decision to split. You have to stick with that decision, in my opinion. We can all go back and have regrets and reruns and say, oh, I should have done this, I should have done that. I, I don't recommend, I personally don't like to live my life that way. I can look back and say, yeah, I made a mistake there and a mistake there. But you know what? I believe that if I retread that, I think it's better to keep growing. I would say to people, how can you instead demonstrate to your children that you are in a path of growth and share that with them? Yeah. It's huge for them. Yeah. So when you say they're just still stuck, either they should get back together and get over it or take responsibility and advantage of the situation they're in. Yeah. I think what I'm really asking too, and, and what a beautiful answer you gave. Thank you for that. And I, I, I want people who are listening to take a moment and pause because so often we come from the perspective of doing what we've always been told is the right thing to do rather than doing what we know in our heart is the right thing to do. And we live with that and we hold on to that for a lot of years until the kids are grown old enough to accept it until my, my wife passed away, but I'm remarried. And she, when I met her, she was still married to her husband, but we didn't have any interaction until she got divorced but she got divorced within two and a half weeks because it, she was in an abusive relationship. And, and when she told her daughter and son who were young, nine and 11 at that time, that she was getting a divorce, her daughter said, boy, I'm surprised you stayed this long. I'm so happy for you. And she was staying together for the kids. I think everybody feels so much. And, and what you say is when people, when kids feel the unhappiness there, but the question I guess I'm really asking is, there is an, there's a hesitancy to change in general. Not change that we want to do, but change that seems like it comes to us. Do you have any words that you can help people to see how change is I, a positive thing? 
I would tell people that actually change is the nature of life. You can go and build up all the stuff, the marriage, the house, the armchair you sit in, the TV show, it's all gonna change. And what we're experiencing right now is proof. Yes. We just all have had the most comfortable, whatever it was, we had our lives completely disrupted right now. Yes. We all have to embrace, we have to learn to embrace change. And I think that, well, as you know, I am a big fan of meditation. But I think one of the things you do when you learn a very simple way to learn to meditate is you come to a deeper part of yourself, which is more likely to be okay with change. Yes. You have to look, you know, sometimes you just have to get a, a good old yellow pad and say, what's the pros and what's the cons? And I feel like the story you just told is perfect. I mean, you have ideas, we all do. How do you know that change won't end up in a really great place? Yes. How do you know unless you try? Right now, we're all being called on to have more courage, to have more faith, right? We, we have to, every person, wherever you are in self-isolation, you can look at the news, which I think is a really terrible idea, but you then have to say, okay, I have courage and I have faith. We're going to make it through this. Everything has changed. I don't know what's going to happen afterward. It's the new normal. So change is good. I, I'm really can't say enough. I've made a lot of big changes in my life and it's because I learned how not to be afraid of change. Love it. And, and let me, let me just reference to people that are listening because we're talking right now in the midst of COVID-19, but some people may be listening at another point that's not COVID-19. And so I just want you to know we are in the, we're in the throes of being isolated for about a month here in California already. And, um, we are moving through that and everything that we knew suddenly isn't. And yet, I just wrote a post today on Facebook. And what I, what's happening is for the first time in, in many, many years, people are seeing the snow on the peaks of the Himalayas 200 kilometers away. For the first time in years, dolphins and swans are occupying the canals in, in Italy. For the first time in years, penguins are showing up along the coast of South Africa. For the first time in years, the, the pollution of the Ganges is, is 40 to 50 percent less, which scientists said would take, would take years and years and years to change. But without us dumping all of our waste into the, into the Ganges and without people bathing in it, without... It, within, within 10 days, the Ganges cleaned itself out, com, almost, half, half, almost completely out. And so we have an opportunity to look at what's happening as all the things that we're losing, or we have an opportunity to look at what's possible. And I often, like my thought right now in COVID-19, I'd love to get your impressions on this, is that if nature can change that dramatically in 10 to 21 days, what about all the pollution that we have in our head? What about all the, all the noise that we have? If we could quiet that down, what would that bring in us? Because we all talk about the new norm, but what I'm seeing is not many people individually are making the new norm switch. They're thinking that out here the world is changing, but they're not thinking in here, what am I, what am I changing? So if I could ask you really personally, because I think you're somebody who is looking at the interchange, how do you see the change of COVID-19 working within you? What's different for you now than it was 21 days ago, 30, 30 days ago? Well, you know, I have always practiced meditation and mindfulness because I learned when I was 19 and that was a long time ago. So I got in the habit, but I will say that right now I am doing it with more, more clarity. I'm seeing that if I actually meditate and get into a place of stillness. There is no COVID-19. It is gone. It is simply doesn't even exist. And when these feelings of panic and fear come over me, because I want to, I, another thing we can learn is how we deeply we are influenced by media mm -hmm. and other people's thoughts, because you can be sitting in your own house, minding your own business. And all of a sudden you feel oh, this fear, this anxiety, you're actually feeling other people's fear and anxiety that has, literally come up in a sort of psychic manner and just pushing on you. So, so, so pause, pause really, that for one minute. Yeah, figure pause out your thoughts. 
Pause there for one minute because you and I live in a world where we understand that very clearly. But there may be some people that are listening that are wondering, what the heck is she talking about? Like, what? tell me if you can and tell our listeners if you can what it feels like to sit in your house and suddenly feel this energy of the world around you psychically or energetically come in and, and, and putting, putting its thoughts, its feelings, its heaviness on you. Tell me how you experience that and what people might experience if they don't even, they might experience it without even knowing they're experiencing it. But what, what might that experience look like? It's quite physical for me. I read a news story. I actually looked at a picture of a very nice young man that had just died of COVID-19, which is, again, one of the things they do now in the media. They picture somebody who's going to make you suffer the most. For So I looked at it, and I literally felt so much pain in my heart. It rose up to my chest. It burned, you know, that feeling like acid. It yeah. just burned and burned, and, and it took days. It gave me a sore throat. It was extremely painful. That would, that It was an instant reaction of pure pain in my heart. And I've also felt like I've been like hit on the side of my head with a sense of uh, panic. And then what happened? Why do I know it's not mine? Because you're right. I, I am alert enough. I recommend this to everybody. Do you know that if you just take a few deep breaths, yeah, beautiful. literally just one inhale, one exhale and focus on it. So you just for those couple minutes, just think about your breathing. If three or four inhales, and you who are listening to the show can do what happened to me, I just did that when I felt that bang on my head, and it, it actually went away because that showed me I'm feeling feelings from other people. Yeah. And I have to say, I think we are, I'm not denying the reality of what's happening, and I think it's going on for at least one more month. Uh, <laughs> but I am saying that if you are sitting there glued to your TV station, Yeah. They're competing with each other. You are looking at a business and the business is to get you to watch and the business is to hook you with stories. They're all competing for the worst stories. So there are bad stories, but there are good stories. Yeah. You have to be one of the good ones, in my opinion. It's your job. Your job is to be positive and radiate positivity, not get into the I am in panic mode and fear. Yeah. That's Part my Part of what I was about to do, I, today, today recording day is April 14th. We'll, we'll, this will probably come out within another week or two. But um, May 1st, I had drawn a line in the sand that I was going to go on a trip around the world oh. to sit on street corners with people who nobody listens to and listen to the voice of the voiceless. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I started to realize is the world, and I was going to film it, and I will still do that. It's just postponed. But one of the things that I realized is that we hear stories from the television and the newspaper that are meant to be caught up in conflict because conflict sells more than peace. And so what I wanted to do is, is when I look out at the world, I see people helping people. Like even in this period of time where people are dying, we see the most ordinary people now, people getting paid minimum wage, putting their life on the line for all of us to live a life that's better by being there as first responders, by being there stocking shelves in grocery stores, by being there testing, doing medical testing. Those are the stories of the people that we need to really start to hear more of, not the people that are in conflict and not Trump lovers and Trump haters yelling at each other at top speed. And to me, the pause of COVID-19 that the whole world has experienced is not just a financial business pause. It's a pause which is a reset to us to say, is this really the life that we want to live? Is this really, do we want to live our life just opposing and yelling and fighting each other about things that who cares? We have an election process where we can vote out when we're unhappy or vote in when we're, when we're happy. But once we make that, like, I love what you said in the beginning, like once we make the decision to divorce or stay, make the decision. Like I, I'm not a big Trump supporter, but once he's our president, we just got to stand behind and, and sort of put our energy to helping to make the world a better place. We, when we, when we vote him out, we vote him out. But all this conflict of fighting each other is really what, I believe 
COVID-19 is trying to do. Because when the pollution of all that disappears from us, our Ganges will be 40 to 50% cleaner. We'll be able to see the peaks of our mountains that we're not able to see. Does that make sense to you? It makes total sense to me. And I think we all could use this time wherever we are to say, and whatever your situation is, whether you're, you know, a mom at home with three young kids or whatever is awkward, difficult situation you're in, there's still an element of being on a retreat, meaning yes. that you are now in a situation where you have never been before. And I don't want to harp on this because there's so many, but there's, you know, another wonderful mindfulness technique is just, just good old fashioned, stay in the present. Yeah. So if you're washing the dishes, guess what? Don't think about anything else. Just, I wash the dish, just focus on it, hone your mind. You have here now an opportunity, not just to get freaked out and worry, but actually to do something meaningful. And yes, the world is healing. I would love to see people heal and find ways in themselves to have a whole different approach to how they live, more joy, if anything. Yeah. Take that tough situation, change. Look, at, it's so much good stuff online, everything's free. People are, you. that's why I'm not gonna harp. You can go online and find 45 ways how to meditate. You can find all kinds of Zen types talking about being the present, but guess what, they're right. You can have all these ways to do it. And so I do see this as a time for positive change. At the same time, we all have to be really careful, okay? No one should get so positive that they should take a chance. This is a deadly situation. That's why we're here. We have to wash our hands. We have to wear our masks. I feel like it's a great time to resolve conflict, however you can do it, and if it means walking away at the end. Okay, you, let's say you're stuck with someone. You may discover that you two can't stand each other. It's over. Well, have the courage to end it and use this time. I've told people use this time to pick up new skills. They're, they're offering all kinds of classes online. Yeah. The, the underwriting message that I'm getting from this time, and I'd be very interested to hear what your thoughts are on it, is we have become so occupied with occupying ourselves yeah. in things to take us away from ourselves that we've lost sight of what it means to be present in the moment. We've lost sight of what it means to know ourselves. When I ask people in the work that I do with people, do you know who you are? People will say, I don't, even know what you're, I don't even know what you're talking about. Do you know why you've come here on this earth? Do you know what your purpose is here? I have no idea. I think we've gotten so caught up, and that's not everybody, but it's a, it's a huge majority of the people that, that come at least come to me to, to speak with me. I think we've gotten so caught up in the work of what we're doing and we're running so fast on that proverbial rat wheel, you know, that we just run and run and run. And we think because we're busy, we're doing something, but we're not doing anything. We're just running. And we get so tired. I think it's the time to, like, let's go out and learn new things or do more things, but go, to go in. Like, the whole thing of we can't go outside. Like, what better message could the, could the, could the world give the world? Is pause. You can't go outside. The only, there's only one place to go, go within. But I don't think we're getting that message somehow. What, what could you say or do to help people, if you feel that's true? What could you say and do, because you've been teaching this for a long time, that would help people notice what they're seeing and say, my answer right now is not being given to me and going out. I can't even go out. Why don't I take this opportunity to get to know myself and go within? So I agree with you. I think I, I'm on social media now more than I used to be. And I'm actually seeing this message yes. on social media. I'm seeing more and more people posting things like, love yourself. Take time for yourself. If you do not feel that you have to be running, this is a new time. This is a time to step back. I saw this beautiful post from uh, New Wales High School, and it was just similar advice from these kids, just saying, if you're tired, rest. You don't have to do anything. 
Yeah. If you need to take it easy and just be quiet, do that. I don't know. I, I, so I should be finding social media helpful right now, but I think that in general, how to get the word out. The media is never going to help us, okay? That's not the agenda, okay? I would withdraw. I would say, first of all, withdraw from media. Do go online. Don't underestimate. Meditation is just a word, okay? You could be calling it brand Z. You could be calling it Tide, okay? Let's practice Tide. Let's practice <laughs> Tide pods. Let's just do something where you close your eyes and you do a focus. That's all meditation ever is. You focus on something. You focus so that you can focus your mind and build a muscle. And by building that muscle and focusing on one thing, then there's not such rebel taggle yakety yak in the mind so much. Then you can go into stillness. And guess what? When you do that, you truly do have a deeper sense of yourself. It's the same exact parallel to the Ganges, not being busy all the time with people. Yeah. You have, we have our phones, we're never still. And this is, I think, enforced stillness and I wouldn't waste it watching Netflix every 20 seconds. I would learn meditation, I would learn mindfulness. It's just words for what you already have, it's free. So I have to say that I have a friend who's, I've been meditating for decades and this is the first time I see anybody starting to pay attention to what teachers have been saying for years. Yes. Which is learn Tide Pods. Learn meditation, learn whatever you want to call it. I just gave it a new name. Right, learn Tide Pods. Away. Learn we're, a way to find we're out. We're going to call this podcast Tide Pods. So tide no. Pods. <laughs> yeah, it's a Tide Podcaster. So I think, I did, how do we do that? How do we get the word out? I think that it's one person at a time. It's one person going on their social media and saying, hey, I just watched this meditation video. I tried it. And guess what? I do feel better. I'm taking some deeper breaths. I feel like my mind is sharper. And once your mind is sharper, it's a, uh, this, it's a positive circle. Yes. Then you're not completely taken out by the fear and the exhaustion and the, you have energy. And Liz, let me, let me jump in a minute because you've been meditating a lot of years. You've been meditating yeah. 40 plus years. I've been meditating 40 plus years every day for 40 plus years often lots of hours a day because I was in a monastery. Um, but there are people and there are people that I work with, even in the spiritual realm, that are scared to death of getting to know themselves. They're scared to death of that empty, still place inside them. And so we can say, go meditate. We can say there's all these resources out there. We can say, take the time to go within. But what do you say to somebody who's scared to death to know themselves? Because as much as they want, one part of them says, this is what I want. I mean, people hire me to help them get to that place that they can't get to. And they, and they pay me good money to do that. <laughs> and yet they fight all along the way because they're just scared to death. And I understand that. It's not that they're really fighting. It's just that they have this super strong desire to get to know themselves and their super strong desire to be scared to death of what will happen when that happens because it's so unfamiliar. So I don't believe it's only a matter of people not knowing that the things exist. And I, I'm, I want your feedback on it because you've been involved in this a long time. What was the thing that scared you the most when you first started your practice and how did you get over that? Well, I definitely think it is scary when you start to meditate and then you go into these, the first time you experience a little stillness, it's like you might jump back. It's like going into deep water, go, oh, that's scary. I don't know if I can swim. And I think for me, the only way that I became okay with that is to keep doing it. So let's say you put one toe in and then maybe a day or two or three later, you put two toes in. Yeah. Maybe it, I think meditation takes quite a while. It's not, no one should worry because <laughs> it's not going to happen. Um, the first time they meditate, they're going into it, some beautiful, blissful. They might, I hope they do, but most people, it's, it's a process. So it's like basketball. You're learning a sport. You learn slowly. You just learn one thing at a time. So no one should be scared. I also think people need to ask themselves that very same question. Daniel, so someone came, comes to me and said, I'm scared to learn to meditate. I'll say to them, okay, 
well, why? Give me three answers. Give me three yeah. reasons. Why are you scared? Yeah. One, well, I think it's strange. And two, I don't know, my pe people might laugh at me. Three, well, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that maybe the me I've worked so hard to develop will dissolve in some way. That's, that's you know, we all have this sense of ourselves that we worked hard to build. Not, so all of these are when you hear them a lot, not good reasons. I would just say, anyone listening, ask yourself the questions. See if you get to the point, what are you scared about? And yeah. realize, is that you, we're at talking apples and oranges here. I and I I'm, I don't think you I I don't think you I don't think what I picked up is what you're intending. So I'm gonna I'm gonna clarify it. And if I'm not saying what you're saying, please clarify what you're saying because like okay. I, I think people are scared. Yeah. And so to tell them not to be scared, I don't think that's really what you're saying. I think you're saying that's okay. You're scared. Go into yeah. that fear and see what it is you're really scared of. Because you can't get over the fear without walking through it. You don't need to build the house in it and live there. But you need to walk through it and look at it and see what it's trying to show you. And when you listen to what, what's going on, I've had so many people say to me, I'm so scared, I'm so scared, I'm so scared. And when we walk into it, it's been a room that they've locked, that they've thrown all their fears into and locked the door. But when they opened it up, nothing was in there anymore. Because there's nothing real in there anymore. And And... When we look and confront the things that we're scared about, most times there's nothing there to frighten us. But we have to walk into it and allow ourselves to experience it. And if you feel scared to do it on your own, go to somebody like Liz or come to somebody like me that will help you guide you through that process so that you won't be alone in that process. But in the end, you're going to have to go through it alone. You're going to have to let go of the hand that holds you and say, I'm here now, and, and let me see what happens. Why do you think people are scared of being themselves? Well, again, I think that we have this sense that we worked hard to be this conglomeration of, of things that we call ourselves, whether it's, you know, just I'm a mom, I'm a dad, I'm a career person, I have a car. We have all these things we identify with quite closely. And I'm not suggesting these are wrong things because, right. but so I think it's a kind of fear that is based on a little bit of maybe just not understanding that the, this inner deeper part of self is so lovely and pretty and helpful and keeps you sane and happy. I, I think it must be a little misunderstanding that we all have. And I know when I, so when I first started meditating at age 19, I was so desperate because I was not happy. And it was a time in college where people were taking tons of drugs and I didn't feel I was stable enough to take drugs, but I wanted to be cool. So that was really my main, main reason to even check into it. And I just remember after, not the first week, not even the second week, but after about two weeks of sitting every day, twice a day and trying this technique of meditation. And then I was told, just forget about it. Just meditate and forget about it. I remember feeling this inner feeling bubble up and it was very like happy. It was childlike almost. And I remember, gosh, what's this? It, it was noticeable because I hadn't been feeling like that. Yeah. And that's what I would just say is that actually there's nothing to fear. And if you don't know who you are, okay, why don't you just say fine? Everyone talks about self-love, and I am feeling a need for love right now. And I don't mean romantic love. I mean love from the heart for your, again, things. It could be just things on your desk as you're sitting here. <laughs> you can love your pen and just go nuts for it. I'd like you to, I like, I, myself, I'm just trying to sit back and go, wow, I love this green weed that's coming through the sidewalk. I have to, I know we've all invited self-love. There are things each of us has to love about ourselves. And I think that is another thing that is the emotion that this whole thing is bringing up. It's been lacking, yeah. heavily, heavily, horribly lacking. And if we love the earth more, we wouldn't do horrible, horrible things to the earth. Yeah. We have to get our love mojo back going. 
And one of the things in that book I wrote is that love, men are really suited to have incredible experiences of higher love. It's just all been repressed terribly. So, so tell us about your book. Tell us about, um, you've written several books. Yes. But your latest one is Women, Meditation, and Power. Is that what you're well, like? They're the two go together, Women, Meditation, and Power. And then I wrote uh, The Power of the Loving Man to kind of support women in their quest for power. Okay. So tell us what you feel is happening and why you wrote those books. Well, I feel that the core imbalance in the world is uh, gender imbalance, male-female imbalance. And when you, I just, first of all, it's a teaching I heard way long ago from a teacher in the in this spiritual world and uh, he said that the power of women's been suppressed for so many centuries and it's thrown the world off balance because his, in his view women are more powerful than men but you know what he's talking about life force he's talking about this inner energy that we all have and we're back to the idea of change if you look at a woman's physical body it has many more symptoms of change from birth through you know, death is just constant change and the more yep. steady in women it is. So let's define that as power. It's change in fluidity. So if you are suppressing and there's whole nations that suppress this innate leadership quality of women that will be very intuitive and in tune with this quality of change, you're, we're in trouble and we are in trouble. Because yeah. I read a study that 90% of men and women still think that men are superior. It's so baked into history, Daniel, I was shocked when yeah. I looked at, into everything. And I thought, I wrote the book because I wanted women to understand this innate power. Women are building up their power. They're talking about it more and more. I think all women and all should understand that not only is it innate, their need to manifest it. I'd love to see more women after this thing. That's one of the things I'd like to see emerge is more of a balance. Yeah. And that means because men are in charge in 90% of situations right now, men will have to step back a little and respect this power. And they also should understand that they have an energy system that looks and is baked in for incredible love. This loving yeah. kindness is totally innate. It's innate in the male system. And it's been repressed. So we've been screwed up for about 5,000 years is my estimate. <laughs> okay, not that long. I <laughs> know, no, but I'm teasing. We're just, we're just the end of it. Because, you know what? The world is so overpopulated. Yes. We, right now, we we're, we're have billions of people with these wrong ideas. And the whole uh, planet is deeply suffering. So I would just start right away. Root cause, I would say, let's get the power of women right up in the forefront. Get it back to where it should be. It's not domination and control. That is not power. Yeah. You said it in front to people, but the conflict is not power. Fluidity is power. And I don't know if you saw this Facebook posting, I just have to say it, that, that said there's seven countries who are leading in the world on this fight. And guess what they have in common? Women leaders. All right, yeah, the leaders are women. Yeah, I didn't know, I haven't seen it, but I would I. I I say it slightly differently than you, but I believe okay. a very similar thing. I believe in the span of time, there are moments where, where influences become stronger and more needed for the world in general. The dominance of the male dominant power, leadership, single vertical reality, which is we lead, we tell you what to do, and especially white men who lead and, and you know, we're self-help people, we fix, we we're teachers teach, governments tell, to tell people what to do, guide. All of that is, is melting now because author, those, that authority and those systems and those organizations and those religious places are sort of becoming less and less believable right now. I wrote a book called The Mosaic. The book is not about the mosaic, what this is, but the concept is so beautiful. The Mosaic is about a horizontal reality where all of the pieces are the same. There is no leader. There is no one above another. They're all laid out on the same, on the same table. And you put those pieces together just by their simple coming together, they create 
a beautiful artistry that couldn't that no piece on its own could have where every voice in the mosaic has a chance to speak i believe the time for the feminine voice has been long overdue it's time for us to be less of a dominant reality and more of a receptive reality where we put aside what we believe and we we allow ourselves to receive an energy from above that is that is much more intelligent, much more gentle, much kinder. And it doesn't have to do with what body we live in or what or whether we're male or female or white or black or Buddhist or Hindu or Muslim or Jewish. It has to do with a change of energy and the energy of the feminine is so needed right now the energy of the heart the energy of the receptive the energy of those of, of that force in the world that listens rather than talks is so important now and i think that anything we can do to to bring that to help to allow that energy we don't have to bring it that energy is coming we just have to we just have to allow it to come through us and live in us um I think it's more energetic than it is body driven. I agree. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> tell us about. We've sort of hinted around it, but we've di we've dived into this beautiful discussion. Mm -hmm. And people may not know who you are and what you do. So tell us a little bit about more about who you are and what you do and how you show up in your days and what sort of work you're doing and what, what type of life you're creating in the world that is your world. Well, you know, like everyone, Daniel, I've had a lot of different career changes over time. But I, and then these are skills actually I always draw on. So it's like nothing was wasted. Yeah. But I did start out my career as a freelance journalist, and that's how I learned how to write. And then I went into Hollywood public relations, why I was in Hollywood, and I was writing articles for some of these places, but I got right into uh, very top PR firms, and that's where I had my, you know, I talked about A-list celebrities. Yeah, I mean, that's what you do. They require, they like public relations people. So uh -huh. I was doing that, and I, I definitely learned from that, and I, but then after, by the end, about early 90s, that's when I thought, I was actually starting to experience some of this, what now is, is just prevalent, which is that everybody is aiming below the knees, <laughs> this sort of foul, dark journalism, which there is a strand of that. And I was starting to see that clients were being attacked for no reason, and not even truthfully. They'd somebody, you know, as a source says kind of thing. And yes. um, so, you know, sort of the basic on a smaller scale of Meghan Markle treatment thing, it, but it was starting way back then. And, and this I, is in the 90s, 1990s. Yeah. So yeah. I thought, you know, why am I here? And um, this teacher I'm studying with, Rama Frederick Lenz, he loved technology. He, and I recommend it to everybody who's looking for a career, who's listening to this. You could go to school for six months at a tech school and have an incredible career for the rest of your life. It's the best and it's good for your meditation ability too, because it's all about putting mental things together. It's not about math. So I went to a, tra a trade school. I learned wow. computer science. And then when I actually got into the workforce, because I had all the communication skills and the management skills, I quickly was put into those positions where I was holding together large projects. It's called project management and there's all different styles of it. But so I like that and I did that for many years. It's very, it's good, it pays really well, it's fun, it's challenging. And then I remember being in New York and uh, it was one of those times when they were cutting back at Morgan Stanley and they cut me back. And I said, fine, I'm, I think I'll go West Coast. A friend of mine lives in New Zealand and she was at this place that needed a communication manager. Wow. <laughs> I said, fine, I'll go to New Zealand. Wow. I packed up. This was, yeah, a lot of things along the way, but that, so I'm, I'm an adventurous person. I have a black belt, which it wow. took me many years to get. 
And that's uh, another thing I recommend, but you can't really do it so well online. But one of your, a good aspiration is to go to any martial arts studio, doesn't matter which one, and learn the skills there because it's all about mental, physical coordination. You sharpen up, you build your energy. Um, I, so that's me. I mean, all along the way, I've taught meditation and now I am a vice president at the Lens Foundation. We, we do give grants to people doing awfully great things. It's wonderful social, wonderful, a lot of teaching meditation and mindfulness, mindfulness to kids. So you see these five and six year old kids learning just to breath, just to follow their breath and relax a little bit because they also got very hyper lives often. So and, back up a minute for people who don't know what the Lens Foundation is. Yeah. Give, us, give us a paragraph. The Lens Foundation was founded by um, uh, Frederick Lenz at the time of his passing. And it, the mission is to help support American Buddhism. And it does it by in a very eclectic way because uh, the definition of a Buddhist, according to Frederick Lenz, was anyone who meditates is a Buddhist. I love that. Because, yeah. If you're meditating, you're seeking something, something, that. inner discovery. You're on that path. And that is whatever you call it, but he said that was his expression. So we do support, uh, like there's a wonderful Buddhist university called Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado, but we do not strictly support Buddhist organizations. We support a lot of places that teach meditation and mindfulness to veterans, to hospital personnel, oh, yes. at prisons, you name it. There's a huge range of interesting people and places. It's on our website, Frederick P. Lenz, no, it's the fredericklensfoundation.org website. We're gonna have that, we're gonna have that in the show notes, right? It's, uh, I think we are gonna have it in the show notes. Okay. You'll, set, you'll send it to me in the event that we don't. You'll send me, make sure you send me the link to that so I can put it in the show okay. I, so what do I do? I do this all day long. I'm, I'm, I'm really busy because either with Lens Foundation, I do teach. I like to teach meditation. I prepare. And I'm also working on not only, you know, podcasts or uh, writing regarding the two books I just did, but I'm preparing an audio book of American Buddhist Rebel. Wow getting ready for that. And I'm also starting on a book two of American Buddhist Rebel. I love to keep self occupied. Yes. And I'm kind of at an age where I'm not going back to technology. Guess what, you guys, if you live long enough, you will reach a point <laughs> where it's just a beautiful place where you kind of think, okay, I've done a lot of stuff. Yeah. I'm going to do stuff I don't want to do going forward that helps people. I want to help people. Yeah. That's for sure. So amongst the life that you've lived and the pivot points that you've had? Well, I would say for me, since I, I'm single, I never married. I have interesting pivot points. Pivot points, age 19, learning to meditate. Then maybe another pivot point, I, I was doing this one form of meditation. It was my world. It was leaving that world. Another pivot point. Then I found this next crazy Buddhist teacher who I never expected to find. That was in the early 80s, that was uh, Frederick Lenz. Wow, what a wonderful adventure. And I had many, I would say, spiritual turning points. I also faced the greatest challenge I ever faced, and I, I faced it bravely and with pride. He was heavily attacked in the media by a small group of mean, <laughs> lying people, and everything was picked up. It was like there was this 80-20 rule in journalism, it's still the same. It's, it's like this little dark, I was trying to do PR for him. It was horrible. Wow. I could, the vibe of the people who would call me, it would be, <clears throat> you know, like Jaws. Yeah. It would be yeah. that nasty thing. It was awful. And, um, I, but I persisted with that. And I always tried to have integrity and, but it was hard because it was hard to be slammed with that kind of energy all the time, but persisted there and I feel like a turning point for me was in courage and bravery. If you stand up for what you believe, there is so much change and honesty and courage in that. Yeah. It's a beautiful act. I, tell me what you think. Tell me what you think of this, because it's, you're saying that it sort of feels like 
it feels like you're painting the picture to the words that I'm saying, but I just want to make sure that that's what's happening. And if it's not, please correct me, okay? Um, it feels like oftentimes we're given situations to see what we really believe. And when we're challenged by the world around us, so often we listen to the sounds of the voices around us and think they have more authority than the voices of the ones within us and the ones that we really believe. And I know for any people that are listening, I want to ask you right now, what are those moments in your life where you're listening more to voices outside of you that don't really say the truth that you're wanting to say? I love that Liz calls them these ugly sort of jaws-like voices that are saying just non-truths. And I'm sure some of them feel that they are true what they're saying. But to, to someone who knows the situation, there's so many times when people are saying things about you or about things that you love that are just not true. Where do you get the courage to just come back to what you know and allow them the freedom to believe whatever they believe? Like the beautiful place that I've gotten to in my life is you have every right to believe whatever it is you want to believe. But so do I. Yeah. And so do I, you know? And so like, I don't want to, I don't, it's not important for me to change your point of view. If you want to believe that and it's making you happy, go and do it. But I want to stand for what is my truth. And I want, to, I want to put my truth out into the world, whether that's you attacking the person that I believe in and me standing in support of them, not because your attacks aren't right or good or in your mind aren't, aren't justified, but because I see, it, I see the world from a different perspective. And to me, pivot points are all about looking at the same thing that we've always looked at from a different perspective. And suddenly there's a huge pivot that happens because you can't stay it's like that picture of the old hag and the young socialite, you know, the, the drawing that they have. When you see it one way, all you can see is an old hag or a socialite. But then suddenly you're, you sh your mind shifts, you change your perception, and suddenly you see the other and you can't even see the other. What gives you the courage to have those pivot points that you've done in so many places? To go, to make the shift from something you were doing to something that's unknown, that could be scary, that's something new that you just go to? That's a, that's, that's a good question. There's no question that I always did reach inside and try to feel a place inside of me that was very quiet and I didn't necessarily do it in overnight. I, it would something where I'd ask myself repeatedly, is this right? Is this what I want to do? For instance, leaving the PR thing to go and actually went across the country. <laughs> I left where I was in Spain even, and I is that something I want to do? And I found this part of me that was brave. It was courageous. It was ready for new adventure in that case. Yeah. And that, was, that, that drove me. And I have to say that in this other case, which was to, you know, stick up for what I felt was right, even though it definitely was uncomfortable. It was very uncomfortable. This, and I grew up in Beverly Hills, remember? I was grew up in a sheltered environment. Right. I never had much of anything that would cause any waves of any kind. But it was so patently untrue. And I asked myself, I remember I said, can I live with myself if I just let this slide? Yeah. If I let someone who is innocent just take it because I didn't have the courage to stand up? Yeah. To me, that's like walk, watching someone that you know is innocent walk by being persecuted yeah. by the crowd because they're yeah. all a bunch of ignorant people. No, I, I felt strongly I could not do that. And, you know, sometimes there's, you know, even this past premonitions of maybe, you know, we believe in it some other life. You know, I was in a circumstances where I could, could not stand up and I also thought, yeah. I am a woman this time that is in a position I can stand up. Yeah. I have no one telling me that I'm a woman. You can't do that. That's over. That BS is gone. So yeah. I, I also viewed it as a, a doorway to be the person I truly am and may have had these qualities repressed in the yeah. past. And I'm talking, you know, other, other lifetimes. <laughs> um, Liz, Liz I, I, I value your time and I know we only have, we're running out. So the question I always end the podcast with is the same question all the time. 
and, and it's when you look out the window and you see the world that we're living in right now. Is this the world you always dreamed of handing over to future generations? And let's pause right there. Is this the world you always dreamed of giving over to the future generations? I don't know the answer because I think change is coming. I hope future generations take advantage of the good knowledge that people are starting to share right now and use that because they're going to need it. The resources are going to come from within. This is really a time where we know we can't rely on anything, material, anything from our planet, even from our environment. We want to change it, but we want to make it so significantly better. So I would say this is a challenging world. Now, someone who's up for challenge is going to enjoy it. But if someone is now saying, I want my life to be like it was for my parents, I don't think that's going to happen. So it's not the world of tradition, but I think it's a world where opportunity will exist for, for fearless, innovative, and kind, and hopefully powerful and loving people to really make a difference. So we're looking for those fearless, passionate, innovative, loving, kind people. If you like, contact us. Let's start to build this movement in a way that we can. Um, let me ask you, I think I know what you're going to say because of, of, of our conversation. But if you could give one tool to people to use to lean in towards to the world that, is, that, would, that would lean the world in the direction of a world that is one that you would love to be proud to say without equivocation that this is the world I'd love to hand over to future generations. What would that one thing be that you would invite people to join you in doing? You know the answer. Yes. I think everyone needs to learn to meditate because that everyone should just have that habit. It's who you are and you just get in touch with this part of yourself that is wiser, that is more still and a much better leader. If everyone's going off just on the surface level of their awareness, they're never going to be as good as they would be if they actually practice. And I would also say, let the women step up now, let women lead. It's time and they're going to do a great job. They already are wherever they lead. You've got to give the planet a chance for that. Um, Liz, thank you so much for being on the show. Please, I know we mentioned your website but and your books, but please take a moment if people want to get in touch with you, want to read more about what you're doing to say it right from your lips, um, where they can go and we'll put it in the show notes too. Everything's on www.lizlewinson.com and that's L-I-Z-L-E-W-I-N-S-O-N.com. So I have books there, I have links and articles and all kinds of good stuff. Perfect. And a contact page. Perfect. Thank you so much. And let me just take one minute if I can and just summarize in my words for those people who have come time and time again to listen to our show. I want you to pause because that's what this time around us is doing. For those of you who are listening in the Mosaic audience, I want you to, to, I want to invite you. I don't want you to do anything. I want to invite you to take a moment to see if it's time for a pause. In talking to Liz today, one of the things that I felt really so beautifully strong coming through her is this whole idea of it doesn't, it's okay if you're scared. It's okay if you don't know how to meditate. It's okay if you don't know where to go. It's okay if you are in a point of transition. Take a step in, make the decision, and once you make the decision, stay with that decision. Because it, it may not come overnight. We're used to a McDonald's-like world where we order our burger and if it's not there in 60 seconds, we get it free. Well, that sometimes is the way it works. Sometimes you will sit down, you will close your eyes and you will have an ecstatic experience and you will be touched for the rest of your life. But sometimes it doesn't happen that way. And in Liz's case, she said it took not one week and not two weeks. And two weeks is a short period of time. But somehow after sitting for two weeks, something happened in her that she could no longer work her way away from. And if you give yourself the time, the world is giving us the time right now 
to pause. You can't say I need to run to the office now because most of us don't need to run to the office. You can't say I'm full with, I got to get to the gym because most of us can't go to the gym. We have time now. What is it that we're doing with this time? Why not sit because we can't go outside and go inside and just be patient with that process. Take time to get to know your friend, just like any other friend. You'll get to know it, your friend of meditation more and more and more the more you spend time with her. And as Liz is saying to, the, to us in, in, the way, in her beautiful way of saying it, it feels like it's time to allow the feminine to come to play a little bit more in all of our lives. It seems like it's time for the domination of the male who knows it all, who tells people what to do, who stands at the top and, 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 and leads from, from a vertical reality to sort of open up now and allow a horizontal reality of, of a receptive, beautiful, feminine energy that leads from a place of love rather than from a place of domination. Allow yourself to experience that within yourself. You don't have to change the world. The beauty to me of the mosaic is it's we're all connected. And if we make the change within ourselves, everything connected to us changes. It, it can't happen otherwise. When the energy changes within us, it changes in, in the, everything connected to us and changes everything connected to the what's connected to us and, and on and on and on. Like a, a Philosopher once answering the question of what is the what is the world like, and the answer was it's frogs all the way down. It doesn't matter. I love the list that call it meditation, call it tie tie pod tide pods. Do call it whatever you want, but just do what's in front of you. Wash your hands with consciousness. Cook your meal with consciousness. Be present in this moment. I hope you will go to the websites, Liz has offered you to go to. I hope you will check out her work. I hope you will become a part of the Lens Foundation. I hope you will donate to them. I hope you will work with her. I hope she'll, you'll learn meditation with her. And until the next time when we have another guest which will overwhelm you and surprise you and confuse you and, and challenge you, I want to thank you for giving us the greatest gift that you could possibly give us, which is your time. Bless you all, and we'll see you next podcast. Thank you again, Liz, and thank you so much to the guests coming. Okay.